like to give you a little con context about public library and education access for African Americans in the South and how it was affected by Jim Crow legislation. Then I'm going to go, I'm going to discuss the history of the Gainesboro Branch Library and focus on the librarianship of Virginia YB. While the history of libraries goes back for centuries, the American public library movement began in Boston in 1852, when the city council ratified city document 37, creating the blueprint for the public libraries we know it, namely that it's supported by city tax dollars and to creating free admission for all, circulation of books for home use, and, and the acquisition of reading materials ranging from scholarly to popular. By the 1870s, a surge of libraries had opened in Northern states and the American Library Association was established in 1876, which helped promote and establish public libraries across the country. However, similar movements in the American South did not take shape until decades later. To complicate the matter, educational opportunities in the South were lacking at best for both white and black citizens. During reconstruction, funding was nearly non-existent for the establishment of adequate educational facilities with public libraries being on the back burner. The predecessors of Jim Crow legislation began as early as 1865 after the ratification of the 13th Amendment where restrictive local and state laws were passed called black codes. These laws were intended to limit freedom for African-Americans and create cheap labor for Southern states. After reconstruction, Southern states began to enact even more discriminatory laws intended to enforce white supremacy, which collectively became known as Jim Crow laws. These laws upheld the separate but equal legal doctrine from the Supreme Court's ruling in Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, which justified segregation in public facilities. With the establishment of libraries in Southern states, services were extended to whites only, although the poor and immigrants were also provided access. Politicians enforced white supremacy, both by custom and law, deliberately denying African-Americans library services with the separate but equal clause, reinforcing these access restrictions. Furthermore, white Southerners did not see education for African-Americans as being fundamental and were rarely amendable to building educational facilities for them. David M. Battles, author of The History of Public Library Access for African-Americans in the South, noted that building a few schools to give African-Americans a rudimentary education was barely tolerable to Southern whites. The notion that African-Americans had become intellectual enough to use libraries was horrific. In the book, Freedom Libraries, the untold story of libraries for African-Americans in the South, author Mike Selby describes the segregation 
of libraries as the cruelest act of Jim Crow. Namely, because the American public library has often been considered one of the most important institutions in America and a beacon of hope for many communities. <clears throat> Despite this, at the time, black leaders such as Booker T. Washington began to demand access to education in the South, laying the ground for slow advances in African-American education. The rise of the black middle class by the early 1900s also saw an increase of African-American scholars who gained considerable influence on American politics. These leaders led black businessmen and clergymen to organize protests regarding the plight of Southern African-Americans, leading to better educational opportunities for their communities. Additionally, intellectual and activist W.E.D. Du Bois, public objection of the 1902 opening of the Atlanta Public Library, which denied access to African-Americans in a city where they made up over one third of the population brought about more public awareness of the need for library facilities for African-Americans in the South and led the way for funding from philanthropists like Andrew Carnegie. With these advances in 1903 came the first public libraries in the South for African-Americans, many of it which were simply additions to other segregated public institutions such as high schools or segregated reading rooms located within white library facilities. The first freestanding library for African-Americans was the Western Colored Branch Library in Louisville, Kentucky, which was opened in 1905 with Carnegie funding. Despite this progress, the Commonwealth of Virginia did not see the establishment of public library facilities for African-Americans until 1921. When the first facility, the Blyden Branch Library, opened in two rooms of the Dunbar Elementary School in Norfolk in July of that year. The second library, the Gainsborough Colored Branch Library in Roanoke opened its doors on December 14, 1921. In Roanoke, Jim Crow laws enacted from 1911 to 1917, in addition to social pressure, restricted where black residents could live and do business. The neighborhood of Gainsborough became the economic and cultural center of Roanoke's African-American community. And this self-contained black community sought to enhance equal opportunities for self-advancement. Like many other Southern localities, the establishment of a black library in Roanoke could not have been accomplished without the persistence of prominent local black leaders. In 1920, when the city announced the formation of a Roanoke Library Association to establish a main library downtown for white citizens, black leaders launched a colored library movement, rallying black churches and civic organizations. With this also came the formation of a colored library advisory committee which included educator Lucy Addison, Reverend A.L. James of First Baptist Church in Gainsborough, and Reverend Lilburn L. Downing, pastor of Fifth Avenue Presbyterian. Together, they advocated for library services for Roanoke's African-American residents and campaigned for funding. Later, like many similar committees in the South, the Colored Library Advisory Committee would not have an official decision-making making standing with the city's white library board and only served in an advisory capacity where there was special business before the board regarding concerns for the city's colored library branch. When the Gainsborough Colored Branch Library was dedicated on December 13, 1921 with a formal, cer formal ceremony held at First Baptist Church, Reverend James noted that the dream of a library for African American for the African-American population of Roanoke had come true. Guest speaker Judge R.C. Jackson of the City Commission remarked that the benefits of a library included knowledge, entertainment, pleasure, new friendships, and the enrichment of the, to the life and purpose of men and women. The following day, the library officially opened to the public in the basement of the newly constructed Oddfellows Hall, 
later known as the William A. Hunt and Branch YMCA on Gainsborough Road and Patton Avenue, which was a short distance from Roanoke's Henry Street, the business district for Roanoke's Black community. Now, many segregated libraries in the South were typically afterthoughts, underfunded, inadequate facilities with minimal collections of cast off material and untrained staff. However, the Gainsborough Library was significant in this regard because although the facilities were small, the opening day collection featured over 2,300 books, many of which had been acquired through the proceeds of a five day book fund campaign held by Roanoke's Black community, raising several thousand dollars. Additionally, Rachel Harris, an assistant librarian from Louisville Western Colored Branch Library, assisted and trained Ella F. Bowden, the first Gainesboro branch librarian for the first two months after opening. From its beginnings, the library served an important role in the education of Roanoke's African American community to Roanoke's African American children. The March 1925 issue of the Negro Progress Record reported that the Gainesboro Library is used largely by school children. In a survey made by the superintendent of schools as to the use of a library by students, he found that in proportion to the population, the colored children were using the library about twice as much as white children were using the city's main library. Now, at the time, Roanoke segregated schools did not have school libraries, and the Gainsborough Library offered, in many cases, the only access to books for Roanoke's African American children. In fact, by 1928, the sheer number of, of students that were using the Gainsborough Library caused staff to only emit one school class to the, into the building at a time in order to avoid overcrowding. That same year, 1928, Virginia Young Lee became the library's fourth branch librarian. And as fate would have it, Lee had spent much of her teen years as a patron of the Gainsborough Library. Lee was well-educated, having attended Roanoke's segregated Harrison School and graduating as class valedictorian. She then went on to become part of the first graduating class of Hampton Institute School of Library Science. Significantly, Hampton Library School was the first African-American college in the nation to issue a bachelor's degree in library science and to be accredited by the American Library Association. As librarian, immediately Lee began to establish a collection of books and other materials on Black history. She modeled this collection after Black Studies collections at some of the nation's leading African-American colleges, including, including Howard University and Hampton Institute. She also began creating Black history displays at the library. However, when city officials objected, Lee was forced to slow the pace of these displays. This would not be the only time that Lee would receive warnings from the city about her actions. Lee's dedication to community education saw the establishment of the Jesse Fawcett Reading Club, named after the Harlem Renaissance poet, scholar, and writer, to encourage reading within the community and to provide education, education programming for residents. Lee's Reading Club not only sought to stimulate reading within the community, but it also sought to spread useful knowledge to club members and provide social and recreational outlets. The club also worked to enlighten attendees through educational lectures by guest speakers. Additionally, the club also oversaw reading initiatives for school children, including reading contests. By the club's 10th anniversary, it reported over 100 members. By the late 1930s, it became apparent that the basement of the Odd Fellows Hall could no longer accommodate the library's growing collection. The Roanoke Library Board began discussions for a possible bond issue to fund the construction of, the, of a new Gainsborough Library building. This bond issue was also, this bond issue would also include finances to fund 
a new downtown main library building. However, two years later, the library board withdrew the Gainesboro Library proposal, instead suggesting that the library expand to another room, the Odd Fellows Hall. This did not bode well with Lee or the community. Lee helped mobilize the Jesse Fawcett Reading Club and various political and civic organizations, community leaders, and businessmen. They formed a coalition, sending a message to the city that Roanoke's Black community was organized. Addressing city council, Black leaders explained that the community had been promised a new library building and Black voters would not vote for the bond issue without it. This act of protest caused the city to then add back the funds for the Gainesboro Library into the bond issue. With Roanoke's Black vote, the bond issue passed, allocating $20,000 for the construction of the new Gainesboro Library. The Collard Library Advisory Committee, whose members at the time were librarian Virginia Y. Lee, Reverend A.L. James, Attorney Jacob Reed, and Dr. Elwood Downing considered multiple sites for the location of the new Gainesboro Branch Library. However, the cost to purchase property was estimated to be a substantial amount of the allocated funds for the library. One of the properties that was being considered by the committee was a lot owned by St. Andrew's Catholic Church on the northeast corner of Patton Avenue and Gainesboro Road, where Shanks Foundry operated. In a 1982 audio recording, Lee recounted how she approached Father Thomas Martin at St. Andrews about acquiring the land that the foundry was located for the library. According to Lee, the discussion went well and church officials originally agreed to lease the property for 99 years for the use of the library. At the time, the church was charging rent to the foundry that was located on the site. However, to be tax exempt, exempt, the property needed to be used for church purposes. This resulted in the church owing back taxes on the property. In 1941, a well-crafted deal was reached that benefited both the church and the city, where the church deeded the property to the city for the use of the library in lieu of paying taxes owed. <clears throat> The design of the new library was imagined and sketched by Lee, inspired from the Tudor style of the Hotel Rona. Architectural firm Eubank and Caldwell completed the design and blueprints for the building. The new building covered over 3,000 square feet and included a main reading room, office, lecture room, reference room, and an unfinished basement. The library's opening day collection was 7,000 titles, and the library boasted over 9,000 registered borrowers. The dedication ceremony on May 10th, 1942 was a joyous affair held at First Baptist Church, Gainesboro and, fe and featured speakers, devotionals and music. The principal address was made by Dr. J. M. Ellison, president of Virginia Union University in Richmond. He said the library was a measurement of the intellectual stride and aspiration of the people who constituted this commonwealth. And that the library was a symbol of the actual and potential intelligence of its citizens. Dr. Ellison also pointed out that the day of the Gainsborough Library's dedication was also the ninth anniversary of Hitler's public bonfires that burned 25,000 books in Berlin. Significantly, this statement echoes the censorship that Black libraries in the South were facing at the time. With white supremacy being the social construct that allowed Jim Crow laws to deny educational opportunities to African Americans, it in many ways also dictated what Black readers could and could not read by seeking to ban books that contradicted the racial status quo. Later, Lee would experience this censorship firsthand. Despite the segregation that Roanoke's Black community encountered, Lee made a point to note that the Gainesboro Library, although a segregated public facility, was welcome to all. Shortly after the new library building opened, she wrote, the library will serve every man, woman, child alike. The greatest of care and scrutiny 
will be used in meeting the needs of its constituency. It will strive to create the proper influence and transmuting power upon all who enter its doors and fit them to live with others and to be entertainers of their own souls. Lee continued to grow the library's collection. However, with limited funds to purchase titles, she supplemented the collection by writing to prominent African-Americans, such as Langston Hughes and W.C. Handy, who would donate signed copies of books, photographs, sheet music, and other materials to the library. The local community was also supportive and su su supplied the library with donations as well. Significantly, today, many of these donations are still housed at the library. Lee was dedicated to providing educational opportunities to the community's children. She used the library as an educational center, creating programs such as book week celebrations and summer reading programs. Lee also continued to use her platform as librarian to provide access to education for adults. In 1943, Lee collaborated with Roanoke segregated William A. Hutton Branch YMCA and the Hampton Institute to launch the People's War College, which was an education series designed to prepare citizens for life during and after World War II. These non-credited courses were both cultural and practical and included religious studies, arts and crafts, bookkeeping, shorthand, English, and mathematics. The courses were taught by teachers from various Roanoke public schools or experts from various professions. Lee noted that the program served as a moral builder during the war. It helped the people of the community to know how to live more abundantly. And at the same time, prepared them for an intelligent participation in post-war years ahead. She went on to write that the program gave the community a more genuine understanding of what is going on in the world today. The program lasted until 1946. In the mid-1940s, Lee again faced backlash from city officials for collecting materials on Black history and culture. She was once again asked to remove Black history displays that had been in the library and to dispose of the growing Black studies collections that she had been amassing. Like many Southern cities, Roanoke's policing of materials on African-American history and culture was just another way of upholding white supremacy. However, Lee risked her job by hiding the offending collection in the basement of the library all the while continuing to collect materials and secretly providing library patrons access to these materials. Later in life, Lee noted that she always knew that there would one day be a widespread interest in the history and heritage of African-Americans and their contributions to America. Her foresight would later become the defining aspect of the importance of the Gainsborough Library's collections. During the civil rights movement in the 1960s, there was a growing national interest in black studies, making Lee's collection much sought after in the Roanoke Valley. In 1963, the Gainsborough Library had the largest circulation of all the branch libraries in the city of Roanoke outside of the main library. Today, the very same collection that Lee both curated and saved from destruction makes up the majority of the works in the Gainsborough Library's Virginia Y. Lee collection. Oh. Integration of public spaces and schools in Roanoke, unlike other Southern communities, proceeded peacefully and cooperatively. By the early 1950s, Roanoke's public libraries desegregated. Because of this, Roanoke did not see the strife that public libraries in other cities in Virginia saw as such was the case in Danville and Petersburg, where libraries chose to close rather than to integrate. In many ways, Roanoke's Black community and Virginia Y. Lee quietly fought the laws and customs that would try to both deny educational opportunities to them and censor the books that contradicted the racial status quo and promoted racial equality. 
This work led to the establishment of a library that served the community through its commitment to educate, educating the public and safeguarded the community access to books on African-American history that were one, at one time forbidden. In 1971, after 43 years of service, Virginia Widely retired. Years later, in 1982, at the de dedication of the Virginia Widely African-American collection, Lee would remark that the library had been her life and that she still had memories of not only trying to make this a star city, but to also have this little Gainesboro branch library shine as bright as any star you've ever seen. In 1976 and 1982, the city of Roanoke attempted to close the Gainesboro Library. However, both closures were stopped due to the community's push for it to remain open. It's important to note that at this time, the Gainesboro neighborhood in Northwest Roanoke had suffered the worst of the city's urban renewal projects and had seen the destruction of over 1,600 homes, 200 businesses, and 24 churches, including the loss of Gainesboro's Henry Street Business District. The results of this displa displacement of Gainesboro residents also affected the use and circulation of the Gainesboro Library. This map from Mary Bishop's uh, January 29th, 1995 Roanoke Times article, How Urban Renewal Uprooted Black Roanoke, visually depicts the destruction of the Gainesboro neighborhood. And I'd like to mention that you see all the, the buildings in red. Those are buildings that were actually destroyed. And what is left in 1995 in this article published are the ones that are in black. The Gainesboro Branch Library was designated a Virginia State Landmark and added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1996, an accomplishment overseen by former librarian Carla Lewis with the involvement of many community leaders and historians. Today, the Gainesboro Library continues to serve the community and strives to honor the dedication legacy of the librarians that came before. The library offers many on-site and online resources for library patrons and researchers interested in the history of the Gainesboro neighborhood and Roanoke's Black community. On-site, we offer local history collections, including vertical files and special collections. The Virginia Y. Lee Collection, which is a rare book collection on Black studies containing many of the books that Lee collected during her librarianship. We also have historical photography collections featuring Roanoke, Roanoke's Gainesboro community by local African-American photographers. Online, we offer finding aids and indexes, Lucy Addison High School yearbooks, photography collections, and neighborhood oral histories. And these items can be found at the Virginia Rooms Digital Database. Thank you. If anybody has any questions. So um, I know for, at one point the city had done a um, study and in the study, they actually recommended um, consolidation of the library branches because the game for a library situation has, has dropped so drastically because of what happened in that community in terms of urban renewal. It was one of the, it was pretty much the only library that they looked to consolidate and close. Also, because it was very close to the main library downtown. However, there was such pushback from, from, from residents that it, it didn't happen. They actually ended up keeping the library. Oh, okay. So the question was, um, um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> oh, she, so she, 
she she asked um, when the, when they were looking to close the library um, if that was because blacks were then able to go to other libraries, which wasn't really the case. No, so the question is, um, where are these historical collections? They're actually still located at the Gainsborough Library. We just share the Virginia Rooms digital database. So what we have available digitally is on the Virginia Room website. Um, however, the Gainsborough Library does retain a special collections archive and vertical files. Um, so we do house them on site. And then the Virginia Y. Lee collection is also on site and there are over 2000 books in that collection that are rare books on African-American studies that Virginia Wiley collected as well as some of the other former librarians. Um, so the question is, um, can, do you have to make an appointment to see the collections or can you just stop by? Um, with the Virginia Wiley collection, it's actually housed in its own room that's open to the public. So anybody can come in there. However, that collection is non-circulating because it's a rare books collection. So you can come by and look at the books anytime. Special collections, we just like to know, get a heads up before you come, just so we know that you should know that you're arriving. And we can also book a study room for you as well. But you know, generally you can just walk in and ask to look at something and, and, and we can provide access to that. Yes, ma'am. What was her source for getting all these books? So not only did she receive a lot of donations from the community and also famous African-Americans to collect these books, but um, at the time, interestingly enough, there was a network of black librarians that were supplying bibliographies of books that they deemed as being super important to black history collections. And in the Virginia Wiley collection, we actually still have some of those bibliographies that were written by the likes of Dorothy Porter, who was a very important librarian at Howard University. Um, so Virginia Wiley was obviously subscribing to these bibliographies and she was using those bibliographies to find books for the collection. Um, it, that was one of the most interesting things that I was able to find out when looking at that collection um, was the fact that she was actively getting the advice from other black librarians. Do, do I have any sense of what her favorite books were in the collection? I actually really do not. Um, I know that um, the Harlem Renaissance writer, um, uh, Jesse, Jesse Fawcett Fal um, was her idol. Um, I do know that, which is why the reading club was named after her. Um, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I think this is a related question. Uh, but did the Gainesville Library enjoy autonomy in terms of acquisition or was there oversight uh, by some white uh, organization? So the question was, were the, was there oversight um, from white librarians about the, the collection acquisition? My assumption is most likely because any of the books that um, she purchased actually had to go through the main library to be cataloged. Um, now, the collection that she ended up hiding and then adding to while it was in the secret library in the basement, my assumption is that some of those books probably weren't sent through the main library to be cataloged. But however, I haven't really seen any primary or secondary source documents to really give me that information. Um, Ma'am, you had a question? Yeah. Um, I don't want to so the question is yeah so the question is um uh, young adult books that actually um go along with this topic and honestly right now i can't really think of anything um however you're, you're more than welcome to contact me and i, I will look for you <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, the, actually the, um, the question is on the walk on Saturday, will the Gainsborough Library be part of that? Yes, it actually starts at the library. <laughs> so um, I know Jordan will go into some of the history of the library, um, but it does start there. And you guys are also, the library will 
be open. So um, after your walk, um, you are welcome to come in and take a look at the building itself and look at the Virginia Wiley collection. Yes, ma'am. I was just saying that some of these books may have come from the people in the neighborhood because it's not an area. Yes. People are African American, got a medical treatment, mm -hmm. and Florida, and all the Creoles, and all of those people lived in that area. So as they traveled, I'm sure they picked up and run up with the little Yes, and, <laughs> and, and for those online, the comment was, um, is that was, did Virginia Wiley require, acquire some of these books from local residents? And that is actually the case. I will tell you that um, there are a couple instances of collection of books within the Virginia Wiley collection that um, if you open them up, there will be some provenance information in there. So it might be somebody's name. Um, so, and also, it was actually well documented that the, the neighborhood was giving her books. So that was actually the case. And like you said, there were so many prominent African Americans in that neighborhood that were actually people of means and had the money to be able to buy these books and give them to the library. Any other questions? Oh, so the question is, did libraries influence the woman from Hidden Figures? I actually don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I think that it, I think that most likely it did. You know, I, I, I guess the question is, is that you probably could look um, and see where she came from, the town she lived in. Did she have library access at all? And I think that would probably be an indication because I'm sure she was well educated that she, if there was library access, she would be doing that. Yeah. Yeah. It is a very inspirational look. Oh, let me get her. So um, the question is about the People's War College and Hampton Institute. Um, so she, Virginia Wiley went to Hampton Institute and she kept close ties with the librarians there. Um, so the People's War College, as far as I know, did not have a broader reach outside of the Roanoke Valley. Um, however, she was working closely with Hampton Institute. I actually still have um, primary source documents at the library that are letters and telegrams um, with back and forth correspondences from um, both the president of the school and librarians there at their, at their library. Um, unfortunately, that program only lasted about three years, but um, the fact that we have so much primary source documentation on it tells me that Virginia Y. Lee found it important that she had done this because we have a whole very thick folder full of um, documents about this program. So I think that in her mind, it was probably one of the highlights of her career because she actually felt like she was really doing something for the community. Um, Sam. So the comment was, is that Jordan Bell's tours are amazing <laughs> and they really are. I've been on them probably like four or five times now maybe and they get better and better. <laughs> so yeah, I definitely recommend it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
Did anyone else have any further questions? I was told I need to talk into the, <laughs> into the screen because the Zoom people missed your introduction. Oh no, okay. And so you probably have figured out by now that the person who's been speaking and, and giving us this fascinating program is Megan Liza. Um, and she is the, the uh, where are my notes? I'm in the wrong part of my notes. Um, she's been the branch manager since June of 21, working at the library. She has curated, maintained, and preserved the library, the Virginia Wiley Collection, which she's been telling us about. Um, an amazing uh, job that she has done, uh, both professionally and, and then for us tonight. Uh, certainly was a, a, a terrific presentation. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Also want to give a few of the details for the Zoom people about um, our walk coming up. Uh, the walking tour is on Saturday at 10 a.m. I get there a few minutes early, bring your sunscreen and your hat and your, your water and your walking shoes. Uh, it's a two hour walk with Jordan Bell. Um, he does these tours and they're fabulous. I'm looking forward to my first, but I've heard so many good things about his tour. So really looking forward to that. Um, there is a fee of $10 per person. For adult, uh, adult being defined as 15 and up, um, the 14 and unders are very welcome, uh, but they are free. Uh, so definitely can can bring them as well. Uh, but that was what uh, uh, I think. So yeah, yeah Saturday, 10 o'clock at the Gainsborough Branch Library. That's the those are the important things. Yeah. And I have a little token of thanks for you. Oh. For you. Well, thank you. Because so, we appreciate you well, coming you and so taking much. your time to do this it. for us. Thank so, you. Thank, thank you, you very much. You. So, does anybody else have any questions or comments before we close for the evening? It's been wonderful having you here. Goodness.